What you're hearing now is the intro to an extra episode of Italian Culture. Think of it like a follow-up, an in-depth analysis of the subject we dealt with in the latest regular episode. There's no narration, no commentary, just the juicy stuff that didn't make the final cut. Two quick things before we commence. 1. Do you remember what the latest episode was about? If you don't, don't listen to it first and come back here. This way, you'll enjoy this episode more. 2. In extra episodes you'll find the first takes and unedited versions of what our guests told us. While regular episodes always feature English or English dubbed commentaries, extra ones do not. This means that there is the chance you're going to be exposed to an unknown quantity of known English language. Listen at your own risk. Speaking of which, buon ascolto. Hello, I'm Roger Collins. I'm an honorary fellow in the School of History, Classics and Archaeology in the University of Edinburgh here in Scotland. And for most of my professional career, I've been a historian of the early Middle Ages. And in the case of a history of the papacy, which I wrote in the early part of the uh, present century, I began with, as it were, the origins of the papacy, Um, the notional creation of the papacy by St. Peter, and took it right up to the time of Benedict XVI. My name is Matt Barbeau. I am a a playwright uh, living in Brooklyn, New York. In this period, I suppose it's largely the localization of the papacy in Rome, in a society itself, I mean, not just Um, in Central Italy or Italy alone, uh, but throughout the whole of Western Europe. In this particular period, the late 9th, 10th century, everything becomes localized. Uh, There's hardly a state uh, that doesn't start to break down. In Western Francia, things are far more, um, as it were, uh, dissolved, um, that, that local authority becomes effectively the only way in in which government operates, that the the king have almost no power at all. I mean, or or what they have is limited to uh, a very small part of northern France. Essentially, this is a period of the breakdown of larger structures of government. That in itself, if you like, might be a negative, um, but kind of localized reaction is positive because this is this is the way things can continue to be done. And I think this is what happens in Rome, hence the rise of the factions. I think the problem with the Roman factions is that we don't have a lot of evidence to identify them. Uh, basically, an awful lot is happening below the surface of the water, and all we're seeing uh, are some of the, uh, uh, as it were, the ripples and, and, and bubbles. And it's not always easy to understand what is causing which particular ripple, or what is behind each particular bubble. But we don't have the kind of detailed sources that give us a kind of um, the names and dates and places. And I I don't think we've got sort of simple factions here. I think there are are multiple and and shifting alliances. Um, And it has to be said about Formosus is that he cannot actually be identified with any one of these factions. he doesn't give the impression of being somebody um, who, again, unlike some of his immediate successors, um, who are themselves closely involved, I mean, who are family members of some of the leading sort of factions in, in the city. You do have this sort of mixture of, of, of people who, if you like, are, are themselves aristocrats um, and who, for what reason or other, uh, acquire high ecclesi- ecclesiastical office. Um, and other popes who are not perhaps socially very distinguished, but who are put up and manipulated by one or more of the factions. Spoleto in this period was perhaps the most uh, significant. 
certainly as far as Rome is concerned, not least because obviously the, the Margravate of Spoleto uh, geographically was closest to Rome, and the Margraves of, of Spoleto with the right allies in Rome, not just in the city, but in the papal uh, states, uh, could exercise an enormous influence. Uh, the Margraves of Tuscany were equally important because, of course, their position further north uh, gave them much more contact with the remaining Carolingian monarchs um, in eastern Francia and western Francia, and indeed um, there were some, some other short-lived, smaller Carolingian states in Burgundy and Provence in this period. Uh, Friuli was perhaps uh, rather more um, to, up to one side uh, and less involved in the, these, uh, and similarly with, with Ivrea. Uh, essentially, the Margravates of, of Spoleto and Tuscany um, were the two most important, and indeed they fought um, a series of short, sharp wars um, when one or other of them claimed the title of King of Italy. Yes, yeah, so it's a very unstable period. The most surprising thing about it is this interest in the, the sort of wider areas of, of papal involvement, uh, for example, in promoting mission, um, in trying to uh, encourage reform, in trying to encourage monasticism. Um, it, it, there's a strange, almost sort of schizophrenic feature of, of the papacy in this period that in Rome itself, there seems to be this, this, this kind of gangsterism, endless violence, upheaval, uh, popes being um, deposed, uh, usually suffocated. Uh, this was, this was uh, if you like, the, uh, uh, the nice way of, of getting rid of a, of a, um, of a deposed or, or imprisoned pope. Um, and at the same time, uh, many of these people, overall responsible uh, for the actions taken against their predecessors and, and, and others um, were carrying out the, uh, the papal office with a high degree of seriousness. I mean, perhaps it's not so much the individuals. I mean, we, we don't know what's happening beneath the surface. Uh, it may be that the, the papal officials were the ones who were really trying to promote the, uh, shall we say, the proper workings of, of the papacy. And certainly some of the individual popes, it's hard to imagine from the accounts we have of them that they were paragons of virtue themselves. But at the same time, the office is operating in an extremely difficult um, and a very tumultuous period. What we see in Rome may not be, uh, shall we say, in the highest uh, uh, tradition of uh, sort of papal uh, rectitude but it re represents a kind of self-defense, a defense mechanism. What's interesting is to see that it doesn't lead to, to a complete loss of the attention to the ideals. It's not just lip service to the ideals. I mean, many of these people, um, including some of the worst of the 10th century popes, um, as they are presented, uh, were actively involved in, for example, the promotion of new monastic houses, and um, the sort of the genuine applying of uh, monastic ideals. Two adjectives, but for most that would be difficult uh, because the evidence is so slight. Um, but obviously controversial, though I suspect in himself he was probably quite pious. Um, I mean, he gives signs of having the, uh, shall we say, a serious-minded pope um, his reign, which only lasts uh, five years, admittedly, um, but that's actually more or less average for the, uh, the pontificates of the period, uh, was not a particularly violent one. He himself does not come across, unlike some of his uh, immediate successors, as, shall we say, an unpleasant figure. Um, there are episodes in his past, and as far as we know, he was born about 816, so he dies aged more or less 80. Uh, so he's a pretty elderly figure for this period. Um, but as I say, although there are one or two episodes in his sort of, in, in the 20 years before his uh, pontificate um, that needs some explanation, uh, he himself does not seem to have been uh, a particularly ruthless or corrupt 
uh, person. And indeed, uh, as a pope, um, his pontificate, from what records we have of it, uh, seems to be marked by uh, a, a strong sense of, of purpose and duty. Uh, he was one of the popes of the period who tried to exercise his, his uh, responsibilities beyond Rome, beyond uh, Italy. I mean, for example, he uh, criticized the bishops of the Anglo-Saxon um, kingdom for uh, failing to attempt to convert the Vikings. Uh, and, uh, perhaps this was a little um, ambitious uh, in the light of what the Vikings were getting up to. Uh, but as I say, it, it marks, as it were, a, a much stronger sense of papal responsibility 